Welcome to Science with Sanjula, where we talk about anything global health. My name is Sanjula Singh, and I am a researcher at the University of Oxford. Join me as I speak to world-leading scientists who tackle today's biggest challenges in healthcare. So here we are today, and we have Professor Peter Horby in the studio. Could you please introduce yourself to us? So I'm uh, Peter Horby. I'm um, currently the Mo Foundation Professor of Emerging Infectious Diseases in the Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford. What made you decide to go to medical school? I was always very interested in biology. Actually, when I was much younger, I always wanted to be the next David Attenborough. <laughs> I um, uh, was, was doing reasonably well at school and I thought medicine would be a great career and I've never regretted it for a second. Um, I was very grateful to get into medical school. In fact, I didn't even get the grades that they asked and I had to phone up and ask for... Uh, you know, a slight uh, waiver. <laughs> really? Um, I think <laughs> students today would be horrified at my grades. And, you know, from the day I arrived, I loved it. It was great. It's a, such a fascinating topic. It's a real privilege to be able to um, treat patients and, and be part of people's um, health, recovery and even death. Could you please tell me a little bit about your first job after medical school? Actually, my very first medical job out of medical school was on the HIV wards at the Middlesex. Um, which was both fascinating and terrifying. You know, right. At that time, there were no treatments for HIV, and we were seeing uh, mostly young men with really horrific illness as a result of uncontrolled HIV and AIDS, uh, and young men dying um, of terrible diseases. And I think that really locked it in for me, that infectious diseases is what I wanted to do. The break for me was SARS-1, 2003. So... When the outbreak started, I lobbied very hard to my bosses to allow me to be seconded to the World Health Organization to go and support the response. And I was um, posted to Vietnam. And let's discuss Vietnam. Could you tell me a little bit more about the work you've done in Vietnam? So I went to Vietnam initially on a, you know, a very short secondment for six weeks for the SARS outbreak, and that, mm -hmm. that was fascinating. It was being right in the sort of the middle of a firestorm of an outbreak where we've got cases in the community and cases in hospital and people dying and everyone's sort of almost fleeing the country and the, the flights were, were completely empty, the airports were completely empty. But another big break then was Jeremy Farrer, who's currently director of the Wellcome Trust, was directing a clinical research unit for Oxford in Ho Chi Minh City. And he rang me up one day and said, you know, would you be interested in moving from WHO uh, and setting up a, a research unit in Hanoi? Quite a telephone call to receive. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's funny because in retrospect, you know, I, I didn't um, know who Jeremy Farrow was um, and asked him to send me a copy of his CV. <laughs> And when I got it and there were 800 publications, I thought, oh, OK, this is a guy to take seriously. Yeah. <laughs> well, he must have been like, wow, Peter's taking this very seriously. <laughs> um, you know, we built that unit up from, you know, me with a pen, um, trying to buy door locks for the new office, you know, having to go myself go to the market to buy the locks for the doors for our new office in, within the hospital um, and getting completely ripped off. Um, and so the first person I employed was an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in 2016, we went back to Hanoi and celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the centre. Um, it, it's been extremely successful. We started off looking at the current problems that we'd had at the time, which were um, avian influenza and SARS, and then, then we, we expanded to seasonal influenza, then other infections and antimicrobial resistance, and and then dengue. And so the questions just kept coming. And it's been gr great to see it you know, pass on to, to other directors with, with great success. After your time in Vietnam, you moved back to the UK after eight years. Could you tell me a little bit more about that time period in your life? So I sat and thought about you know, where I felt my, my niche was um, and and started the the Epidemic Diseases Research Group, Oxford, ergo. And the return to Oxford and setting up that small group coincided with the West Africa Ebola outbreak. One of the things I've learned is that you've got to get your 
sort of your boots on the ground, you know, wh- wherever there's a problem, whether it's in, you know, whether it's in, in London or it's in Sierra Leone or it's in Hanoi, as soon as you sort of step into the, 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 the environment of the outbreak, you learn so much. You know, as soon as you go into that hospital or go into that setting or go into that Ebola treatment unit, y- you've learnt enormous amounts about yeah. what the context is that you just can't grasp from the newsreels and from the telephone and from talking to people. And, and whilst you were doing that, what did you learn? We were faced with a situation where we were trying to set up a clinical trial which is, you know, where you compare a new treatment to existing um, treatments and see if it improves out clinical outcomes. And a lot of the normal procedures just went out the window. You know, a classic example is you need to have someone's consent for them to be in, in any research study. So you need to explain the study to them. And then you need evidence that they have given informed consent, which would normally be they would read an information leaflet read a consent form, sign the consent form, you would file the consent form as evidence that this patient gave informed consent. You can't take anything out of an Ebola treatment unit, it's all burnt. So the consent forms could be signed, but they couldn't leave the Ebola treatment unit, they would have to be burnt. So where's your evidence of um, consent? And how did you go around these complications? Like, what were your solutions to those problems? You just, uh, you know, had to find ways. So for the consent forms we had a clipboard on the what they call the hot zone the infected side you would go in uh, in your protective equipment you would talk to the patient you would get the consent you would obviously do that with um, you know one of the, the the staff of you know of the national country so it would be in in, in the local language the patient would sign the consent form you would then put it on a clipboard you know facing outwards through the fence from the hot zone and somebody in the in the green zone, in the clean zone, would take a photograph of it with a digital camera across the zone. And then we had a digital record. And then you would burn the consent form. And do you feel like with all your experience, you could set up a sort of like protocol or a system for future pandemics um, to do research during those times? After the, the 2009 swine flu pandemic, which thankfully was very mild, we reflected on what we'd achieved in terms of clinical research and the answer was a big fat zero you know really had achieved almost nothing and this is for um, influenza which we knew was the number one pandemic risk so we knew we'd get a pandemic it wasn't a particularly dangerous version so there weren't the operational logistic constraints that you saw with Ebola yet we still failed to do any good research so it's really since 2009 we've been really focused on improving the clinical research response to epidemic epidemic infections. And we have improved over the years. You know, we did um, something in the West Africa Ebola outbreak. Uh, the, there was, this was then followed by a big outbreak in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there was a, a trial that was set up that was more collaborative. So instead of competing trials, um, this trial was led by the National Institutes of Health in the US and there was a collaboration among an, a number of people that had been active in the West Africa Ebola outbreak and that trial was successful and it found new treatments for Ebola for the first time. So that was real progress and then when we had the COVID-19 pandemic we really, I think, um, um, yeah, hit the bullseye. Right, I think we should dive a bit more deeper into that because obviously you've run the recovery trial, um, which has been the largest trial on on COVID. What were your initial thoughts whilst the COVID pandemic was starting? So you're very early on, like others, based on previous experience, my thought was, this doesn't look good. We've got to do something very, very quickly because it may or may not become a large-scale epidemic or even a pandemic. But either way, if we're going to advance care and uh, improve outcomes for patients, we've got to you know, get out of the blocks immediately. So I um, actually uh, sent a text message to one of my colleagues in China, um, and we had our first conversation by telephone on 2nd of January. So very early. And 
those international networks of co colleagues who were working on epidemic infections really sprung into action then. And we then had a call between my colleague in China, myself, and a colleague in Saudi Arabia who had been running clinical trials of Middle East respiratory coronavirus, which is a related virus from camels that causes severe respiratory disease. And we designed a trial. So the very first um, randomized controlled trial of, of a new treatment was, was started in Wuhan um, very early on uh, in late January. And then that was followed very shortly afterwards by a randomized placebo controlled trial where we have a, a sort of you know, a dummy product. So um, nobody really knows who's getting what. So it, it reduces any biases. So that I felt was a real success within you know, the first two months of the pandemic. We already had two trials set up in Wuhan in China. And what were the results of those first two trials? Well, they recruited very well to begin with, and then it massively drops the numbers of cases because of the very stringent control measures that were put in place in Wuhan, effectively locking down a very large city. The case numbers plummeted. So we finished both of, so both of those trials enrolled about 200 patients each and gave an answer, but not an answer that was, that was robust enough to be really clear whether the drugs... Uh, there was no evidence either the drug worked, but the data were not strong enough to say that with confidence. They were too small. So while we'd been running those trials, uh, in the UK, the research councils have put out a call for groups to do clinical trials in COVID-19. So we actually put in an application saying, we've started these two trials in Wuhan, you know, led by colleagues in China, but supported by us. They've recruited patients successfully. They're the only two clinical trials running. Can you give us some more money so that we can extend this to more widely in China to enroll a lot more patients and test some more drugs? And I was actually at a, at a meeting, uh, an annual meeting of, of one of our consortia called the International Severe Acute Respiratory Infections Consortium, which was set up after 2009 to solve the problem of the failure of clinical research in epidemics. And it was at that meeting in Annecy in France that we got the message that um, the funding was successful. We would be funded to do more clinical trials in COVID-19, but don't do them in China. You've got to do them in the UK because there's not, there's not many cases in China now. Um, and we can see that there is a, a huge wave of infections about to hit the UK. Um, well, that's a great moment to receive that news, first of all. <laughs> that must have been uh, yeah, a lovely moment. I was both pleased and slightly alarmed because you know, my specialty is tropical medicine and working in low-income settings and had never run any research in the UK, uh, which is obviously a different context than I'm used to. So it was clear that you know I was going to need help to do this. So that's when I reached out to Martin Landre in the Department of Population Health, who, who, who I knew we, we weren't, um, we hadn't worked on anything together. We'd sort of met at a couple of events, that was all. But I knew of the work that that group had done on very large scale cardiovascular trials, very successfully, one of the preeminent sort of clinical trials groups in the world. Right, it was the perfect moment, I guess. So it was the perfect moment. We had the money, we had certainly had enough patients, it looked like, would be coming. And when Martin and I talked, Martin was up for it. And so it was a perfect marriage, really. We had somebody with the experience to um, get a very large-scale trial up and running in the UK and my experience of infectious diseases and epidemics. Um, and a lot of work, obviously, um, and a lot of support from others, particularly from government, I must say. Um, it was uh, um, a better success than we could ever have imagined. What were you testing exactly? So we started it with what we call repurposed drugs, so drugs that were already in the pharmacy cupboard, so we could get going straight away. And later we introduced um, newer medications, more experimental drugs. But one of our first decisions was obviously to put hydroxychloroquine in because that was the flavour of the month and everyone was claiming it was a, a miracle cure. And um, the you know the clinical trial skeptics amongst us said it's not anything until you it, it's just hydroxychloroquine it's certainly not a treatment until you prove it works and then we also put in dexamethasone because again that's a extremely available very cheap uh, anti-inflammatory drug there had already been some a lot of thinking about using 
um, dexamethasone in respiratory viral infections. But it was very controversial. There were a lot of people saying, don't do it. You, you shouldn't be suppressing the immune system in people who are trying to fight off an infection and it would be dangerous. And there were other people like Wei Shen and others and myself who thought, no, you know, there's, there's a lot of inflammation and this could be beneficial. And that's the ideal time to do a trial. When there's complete disagreement, if there's you know, polar opposites and no one can agree, well, let's resolve it. Let's, right. let's do a proper trial. Um, we did, and I'm so pleased we put dexamethasone into the trial. It was our first positive result. It had a major benefit. It's completely inexpensive. It's a few pounds. It's in every pharmacy. In fact, you can buy it on the streets in some countries. And uh, it reduces mortality in patients with severe disease by 20 to 30%, so a huge success. And it's now, um, for severe patients with COVID, it's the standard treatment worldwide. Moving away from COVID, some people argue that we're living in an era of constant threat of new pandemics. Do you think it's true? Do you think we should be living in a certain state of emergency? We've always been susceptible to, to new infections. If you look at you know all of the infections we currently live with, measles, polio, etc., etc., dengue, if you trace them back, they all at some point crossed over from animal species in, into humans. Just in the past, we weren't detecting it we weren't spotting it we're much better at spotting it now so it's something that we have to recognize that we live with there are enormous number of viruses out there we only know about a fraction of them there will always be risks of these viruses crossing over from animal species um, to humans and evolving and infecting us and so it's a constant risk that we have to learn to live with there are aspects of i think modern living that that increase the risks of you know, more severe uh, epidemics and pandemics, particularly you know, global human uh, density. You know, there's a lot more people in the world, there's a lot more bigger cities and there's a lot more density of population, which obviously increases the risk of viruses that have come over from animal species spreading from person to person. And the more that these viruses spread from person to person, the more they can adapt through evolution and become fit for the human species with a greater risk of a pandemic and we're seeing a lot more global connectivity it's so much easier to travel between you know small rural areas in any country to big cities and then on to other countries and so we're in a situation where we will see that crossover as we always have from animal species but the risk now of more dramatic spread and evolution is greater and then i would like to um, ask you to give a mini lecture on <laughs> what we could do to prevent future pandemics better. And I'll give you one minute for that. We can't prevent viruses from spreading from animals to humans. So what we need to do is to reduce the risk of that spread first. And that involves looking at how we encroach on wildlife and eco ecological systems and not disrupting them. And also looking at how we raise uh, animals in the, in, in the commercial agricultural sector. Second step then is to detect the crossover when it occurs. So I think we need to enhance the clinical surveillance for um, disease. So that gives us the early signal that there is a, a serious, real and present threat that it's crossed over, it's causing disease, um, and it could evolve and spread. And then thirdly, we need to be able to respond. If somebody presses the red button, we need to be able to respond and contain there would have been a window opportunity to stop the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to be making ourselves competent and capable to do that, to go there, to respond, to contain. All that needs long-term financial investment and long-term sort of human investment in this as a, as a scientific and public health endeavour. I think that was a beautiful lecture. If there's one thing you would like to do in your future career, because you've had you've done so many, I think, impressive parts already. We've talked about your Vietnam work, your work on Ebola, the recovery trial on COVID. What would that be? If there's one more star you can add to your CV, what would that be? We have launched the Pandemic Sciences Institute in Oxford, and I really wish that you know to be 
um, a global success, as in it's perceived uh, as a global asset that has global impact in terms of uh, reducing um, the risk to human health and socioeconomic um, disruption from epidemic infectious diseases. Then my very final question in this podcast interview, what would your advice be on a personal and on a professional level? Be persistent. You know, if there's something you want to do, you know, just keep pushing. Uh, eventually you, you'll get a break and that may make all the difference, as it did for me getting my first break working overseas made a huge difference. Nobody now asks me if I've got any experience of working in low-middle-income countries. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second is um, be brave and take chances. You know, I've done several things in my career that um, at face value look to be highly risky um, in terms of my career and likelihood of success. But I felt that they was something that I wanted to do and something worth taking a risk for. And I'm so pleased I did because they all worked in my favour in the end. Thank you so much for being here today with me, Peter. And to everybody listening, please join me next week for another episode of Science with Sanjula, where I'll be speaking with Professor Patricia Kingori about a range of subjects, including ethics and equity. <laughs>